Excellencies, Commander of the Royal Military Academy, ladies and gentlemen, I do not know whether the microphone is on, otherwise I can shout, but it is working. Now, for those of you who know the Palace of the Academies, you know that the facade looking towards the heart of Brussels is identical to the one that is directed towards Europe. So this palace is outstanding, and it is a beautiful symbol of what academies should be. They should be transitions between the international level and the local level. So we can look towards the town hall of Brussels, and on the other side, we can look at the impressive building of the European Parliament. And I would say that there is some kind of an agreement with France for the moment, because for the French presidency of the Council of the European Union, we have a president, a local head of state, who would like to be open to the international dimension. And so I think it was quite logical to celebrate the, 20, uh, the 2050th anniversary of the Royal Academy of Belgium with the uh, French Presidency of the Council of the European Union. And um, to celebrate this event, we decided to talk about Europe. And we would like to talk about two topics that are not really the um, competence of the EU. In January, we talked about Europe for culture, and we know that culture is not a European matter as such. And I would like to seize this opportunity to welcome our Commissioner Busquin, our colleague Philippe Busquin, because on the contrary, on the opposite, research is a European competence. And the research area is something that is at the foundation of the EU. Europe was built on free market, on the free movement of services, goods, and people, and it should also be built on this uh, free the, um, circulation, free movement of data, research, and publications. And I believe that this is a new foundation for Europe. And uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to start the second debate. And in just a moment, I will have the pleasure to introduce to you the uh, speakers for this debate. But since today is the 22nd of March, 2022, I would like to seize this opportunity to talk about the barbaric conflict that is happening right next to the EU, at the door of the EU. And six years after the terrorist attacks that struck Brussels. That was on the 22nd of March, 2016. And I remember at the time I was uh, the president of a university in Brussels, and we thought that the world was changing. And I believe that it partly changed at that time. We were thinking of our students who were in the city, and we were thinking about our lessons and classrooms, because um, I was already in the office when we heard about the attacks, and the authorities told us that the uh, two next targets would probably be a university and a hospital. And you had a university and a university hospital. So the 22nd of March was really dramatic. It was a tragedy, and I believe it is still in the minds and the memories of 
the Belgian citizen. So we are in a world that is tending to close itself um, because of terrorism, because of war. And I believe that it is all the more important to talk about research, to talk about exchanging data, exchanging publications and organizing exchanges between researchers so that the world can remain open and not be closed internally because of terrorism or externally because of the imperialistic approach of others. And I believe that this topic is a very important topic for Europe, but it is also very important for the lifestyle and the model we would like to develop here in Brussels. And I would like to hand over now to the Ambassador of France here in Belgium. Thank you very much. Mr. Permanent Secretary of the Royal Academy of Belgium, Mrs. the President of University Paris-Saclay, Mrs. the Secretary General of the National Fund for Scientific Research, Mr. the Coordinator for Open Science in the Ministry for Research and the Innovation in France, um, and Mr. the General Director for Research and Innovation in Solvay. And I would like to apologize if I have forgotten anybody. And I would like to apologize because uh, I was a bit late and I delayed slightly the start of this conference, so I would like to apologize. And um, this can be explained by my recent arrival in Brussels, and it is the first time I have the pleasure to join you here and to accept this uh, invitation in this uh, beautiful in in institution, this ancient, ancient institution uh, my country had the opportunity to cooperate with for so long. And I'm delighted to be here with you to take part to these exchanges about new European policies around research and knowledge. And I'm looking forward to listen to the panelists who will share their views and their ideas with us. And I fully agree with you, Mr. Permanent Secretary of the Royal Academy, about the importance of this event and this conference. We are facing many uh, difficulties. Uh, we are facing so much violence that it is all the more important for the EU to take up this challenge and to achieve this mission. And it's also very important for you. I believe it is very important to talk about these ideas, about these topics and not to give in to the violence that we can witness. And of course, we all think of the difficulties that are going on and for the uh, tragic consequences for the population and for Europe following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And um, this conference is related to a very important mission, i.e. creating a European area for research, offering an institutional framework in Europe, but we would also like to promote a general ethical dimension. And ever since the beginning of the French presidency of the Council of the European Union, last January, we have um, decided to promote the creation of this European area for research and this European knowledge. Um, this is one of the priorities of our presidency. And in the framework of this presidency, just a few days ago in Marseille on the 8th of March, we had a ministerial conference and the purpose was to define a global approach for research and innovation, but also for high education and uh, the uh, Marseille Declaration was uh, drafted following that work and it is, it's a perfect illustration of the need 
for this international cooperation for higher education, knowledge and research. This is an important strategic priority for the EU. And uh, we remember what Auguste Comte said. We need to know in order to anticipate and make forecasts. Uh, we uh, need to think about the building of this Europe for tomorrow. And in the framework of this new institutional approach, we need to consider science on, as a common good that should be shared in a democratic way and that should be accessible to all. This European framework for knowledge can be translated into very practical events and actions, actions launched by the European universities, actions launched by the President of the Republic in 2017. We have 41 actions with 281 high education institutions coming from the different members states of the EU, but also from Is Iceland, Norway, Turkey, and the UK. And this consortium is aiming at promoting the free mov movement of researchers and students in order to promote exchange and promote education, higher education, and research. There is another aspect to this Europe of knowledge, and that is open science. And this is not a new concern. This is a center of interest that you all share, I believe, and this is something that we have to develop on a permanent basis. This Europe of knowledge and the development of open science leads to challenges related to transparency for research in order to speed up and increase the democratic dimension of this Europe of knowledge. And in Paris, in, um, there was a uh, European Day for Open Science on the 4th and the 5th of February, and this is a perfect illustration of the importance of this topic for the EU. And I would like to thank the Royal Academy in Belgium and its permanent secretary for giving us this opportunity to exchange and to discuss tonight. I would also like to thank the members of the panel who have accepted to be here physically. And this is really a great pleasure to see you and to have this opportunity to meet you. And I would like to thank all the speakers, and I'm looking forward to listening to you, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I am certain that uh, we can highlight interesting opportunities for cooperation, interesting ideas, thanks to this discussion, and that we can build upon these reflections in the coming months. I would like to thank you very much, and I would like to wish you a very fruitful conference. And I'm looking forward to listening to you. And of course, I would like to be able to support you in your projects, because this is the purpose of the action that we would like to carry out in the framework of the French Presidency of the Council of the European Union. Thank you very much. Well, first and foremost, I would like to thank all the speakers and I would like to introduce them to you. So I would like to introduce the members of the panel. And I will start with Véronique Alloin, who's far away from me. Véronique Alloin, I'm sure many of you know her. She's the General Secretary of the National Fund for Scientific Research, a chemical engineer. And I can say it now, she was elected a member of the Royal Academy in Belgium 
that is taking part to many actions on scientific advice with FNRS and the CERN. And I believe that she is in the best position to take part to this discussion. She's also president of the European Science Foundation with the uh, Science Connect group. And this uh, fund for scientific research, FNRS, has been led by Véronique Alloin since 2008-2009. I think it is made up of about 2,000 researchers, and it's uh, a bit comparable to Solvay, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it's a similar size on the public side and on the uh, private side. We'll come back to that. And uh, I believe that you manage 200 and 200 million next to the different funds. Then we would like to welcome Marin Dacos, who um, studied uh, history, and we share the same background. We are two historians, dear Marin, but. Um, next to history, and I believe that he studied the history of popular photography. I believe it is important to highlight that before he decided to turn to sociology of innovations, and I believe that this can be very interesting for Nicolas cudre moreau But of course, um, he uh, defines himself as a digital humanist. I've read something like this somewhere, and uh, he is the champion of uh, digital humanities in France and of uh, free access to science. And he is an advisor with the general director of the Ministry, the Ministry for Research and Innovation, Claire Giry. And I believe that he uh, has been involved in that work for many years, and he has seen different directors. And he was a former director and a founder of the uh, European Edition Center and the uh, founder of Open Edition that many of you know, and that is dedicated to uh, digital education in human and social sciences. And that's an excellent uh, equipment in France. He's also the founder of uh, Revue.org. And I believe that some of us uh, use that on a regular basis. And um, that's thanks to him. Now, Sylvie Rotaillot is the president of the Paris-Saclay Paris University, a very significant and large university with a long tradition and history with other universities such as Paris-Sud. Uh, Sylvie Rotaillot is a uh, physici physicist, and um, she has started in this position, uh, well, in March 2020, so she was not lucky in that respect because she arrived in that position just before COVID, but um, despite the health crisis, the University Paris-Saclay carried out major actions, and it is one of the most significant and important universities in France uh, in terms of its reputation and its size. And then finally, uh, Nicolas cudré moreau who also uh, studied engineering in uh, material sciences, but I believe you were born in Luxembourg, but you come from Switzerland and you are an associate member of the Royal Academy in Belgium and you are the uh, general director of the uh, Department Research and Innovation in Solvay. And before that, he worked in Dupont de Memur in different countries. And um, this is one of uh, his center of interests, the geopolitical and cultural aspects of research and the impact on society. He is leading this department 
ever since 2015, and uh, there are 2,100 scientists in this department, Research and Innovation in Solvay, with a 350 million investment. Uh, so that's more than the FNRS and more than 280 patents for just one year. So this is a significant activity that he's trying to coordinate and organize, taking into account the economic interests and the uh, interests for eco-mobility or efficient management of resources. So, as you can see, our speakers have different backgrounds, different profiles, and I would like to invite you to start the discussion. And to do that, I would like to ask you a very simple question, and we know that when we start a discussion, it is important to define the topic that will be tackled. So I'm going to ask you to define the topic of our event, of our conference today. So, in your view, what do we mean by Europe of knowledge? And what are the expectations you may have about this Europe of knowledge? In my opinion, knowledge is about uh, knowing, about science, about education, about research as well. Research is a, uh, a knowledge that is evolving, that is uh, moving. And it also uh, makes me think of the European uh, research uh, framework that has attempted to an endeavor to make Europe a competitive uh, continent that has endeavored to uh, take up uh, society's uh, challenges. This is the core of the project. And while I was reflecting about your question, I thought we could also speak about uh, the uh, lack of knowledge or the Europe uh, where the lack of knowledge and the uh, ignorance prevails, where the, the views uh, uh, are well, substitute uh, knowledge. So it is, in a way, the uh, Europe of the lack of enlightenment. In my opinion, research is growingly uh, cross-disciplinary. So I'd like to talk about uh, a Europe of uh, diverse uh, and various uh, knowledge, uh, of uh, many types of knowledge. And I, I think that uh, in, in the future, cross-cutting research will certainly be promoted. Not surprise you in saying that uh, knowledge is, uh, is a valuable good. Now, if you ask me for a bottle of water, I will give it to you and then lose it, but, uh, and you will lose it, but, but uh, you never lose the, you never lose knowledge. So I think that uh, the, uh, we, we, we very much try to lock knowledge into borders, into walls. I think that access to knowledge has to be made easier. Uh, those unexpected uh, uh, sparks that uh, we, we need, we know that uh, many interconnections uh, have not been uh, prepared. So Europe of knowledge is the Europe that does not exist yet, and we need to, oh, to, to build it. And it is also the Europe of uh, open <laughs> knowledge that we need to build. Now, let me speak about another aspect of knowledge. Uh, speaking about uh, Europe of knowledge uh, is also speaking about the tools, the innovation and research tools that uh, universities use in Europe. And I think that in, in higher education and when it comes to innovation and research, we use uh, several uh, tools based on training, research, and innovation. This is um, the um, 
those three dimensions go with each other, go hand in hand. When we talk about research, we also talk about production of knowledge. When we talk about education and training, we also talk about transfer of knowledge. And being open is about being accessible. It is also about spreading knowledge through innovative uh, techniques. This is quite uh, important, making sure that knowledge and data are accessible. And it is also about uh, using, uh, using know-how, using academic knowledge uh, to meet uh, the, uh, the various challenges about uh, uh, digital transition, climate change, uh, renewable energy. So this exhaustive chain that uh, makes up the Europe of knowledge will certainly make us uh, stronger. Now, I will try to say something a bit different and avoid repeating what my neighbors have just said. So let me focus on Europe rather than on knowledge. I, I, I come from a... a, a, a a non-EU country, though uh, Switzerland has uh, built uh, a lot of links with uh, Europe. I would uh, like to use the word interdependence, interconnection. This is a, a key word. We, there are many European projects, there are several of them, and achieve an understanding that uh, these projects will never uh, come to light whether, without this interconnection is key. Uh, exchanges play a crucial role, cryptic maps play a crucial role, but let's not forget that knowledge is a field where we can easily build foundations, or at least more easily than in, than in other fields where uh, European countries will try to preserve their intellectual property, will try to preserve their differences. Scientists, the researchers, lot to exchange and need to exchange. So beyond the exchange of information, of data, and beyond the speeding up of information, let's not forget that this uh, interconnection is uh, the pillar on which we could build uh, further cooperation. There are many projects that will change Europe and change the world, and we need to cooperate on these projects. Sharing information, sharing data is only the beginning, but uh, it's still quite crucial. So I think that uh, we have here the table of uh, contents in a way that uh, we can uh, use as a basis. Now, open science, and I would like to turn to Maranda Koz. France has just uh, published its second action plan on open science for the, um, the period comprised between 2021 and 2024. What are the main pillars of this new action plan, and what are the changes um, foreseen by the new action plan? Now, first of all, I'd like to give a definition of open science which we very often confuse with public access to publications. But the two concepts are not exactly the same. Now, open science is a very ambitious uh, paradigm. It is uh, what uh, uh, science is all about, because public science should always be uh, open. Now, uh, of course, it's very different when we talk about science funded by private funds. I think that we need to open the, the black box of uh, scientific processes that lead uh, to uh, knowledge. Now, what is important is the, the foundation. And in the second plan, uh, compared to the first plan that was uh, launched in 2018, we have uh, strengthened the basis on less obvious matters. Because moving towards open publications is not easy, it is costly, it uh, generates a lot of talk, but it doesn't change anything uh, to the essence of the process. 
public an, an open publication entails an open access and and but we don't change the way we transfer knowledge we do not publish any secret in a publication however there are uh, secrets in, um, in 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 these recipes uh, protocols experiments methodologies uh, uh, codes and data that produce science so we've added a new chapter on software that did not exist in the first action plan because it was not mature enough at the time. And we have outlined the importance of data for uh, logistics reasons. In uh, the 70s and in the 80s, it wasn't possible to publish the data that had been collected uh, to generate such outcomes. So we would publish graphs and data, and it was uh, the maximum we uh, could uh, do. And we would also perhaps have a look at our neighbors' archives. But at the time, we could exclusively publish a publication. Today, the digital era has uh, transformed everything. Thing. We worked on the Human Genome Project. We shared and we continue sharing the uh, sequencing of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, worldwide, and this has been made possible by the digital era. Now, of course, it has led to many uh, questions. First of all, researchers are not used, were not used to sharing their data. In the past, they would uh, keep their data for themselves in the hope of uh, carrying out another study. Uh, they feared their work would uh, be copied. So there are indeed in, in some fields researchers who uh, are frightened about uh, sharing their data. But I think that we have a lot to win by uh, sharing uh, data now. Some researchers are talking about uh, the uh, uberization of uh, the research uh, uh, field, and, 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 and they imagine that some American spies would uh, use a helicopter, come here to Europe, and, and copy these uh, data. So I think that we should regulate uh, the research world, first of all, to be able to reuse data, to reuse them several times, uh, to uh, reproduce them. I think that we are going through a reproducibility crisis. We have tried uh, to repeat uh, experiments. We haven't been able able to do so, perhaps the protocol was um had uh, shortcomings and didn't make it possible. There is also a lack of ethics and a lack of transparency. And society needs uh, more transparency and needs more ethics. Now, what is difficult with data? Well, these uh, data are collected from surveys, from um, pools. But do we understand data? And uh, society understand uh, data. If you only share data with uh, uh, peers or with people who will not understand these data, you're not sharing anything. So I think that you also have to make this educational uh, transfer of knowledge. However, this is not recognized and this is very difficult and it is also very costly. So in the future, I think that we need uh, to uh, acknowledge the educational work of uh, research, which is key because uh, it is the support of, uh, it is a pillar of knowledge. And as I said, we have included a chapter on uh, software. Uh, now, of course, uh, data are being processed by macros, by softwares, and we've been able to demonstrate that with two different machines, we have two different images of a brain because we use a different uh, version of a library, the 1.1 uh, uh, version of the machine does not give the same outcomes 
as the 1.2 version of the machine. So I think that we need to guarantee full access to uh, these uh, uh, softwares. Now, I won't dwell on the details, and you've asked me to avoid being too long, so I will not uh, go into the details of the action plan. Let me just finish with an anecdote. Now, when we discovered the hole in the uh, ozone layer, this can be considered as open science. A researcher went to the pole, uh, and, and, and this is a true story. So a researcher went to the pole, he uh, took a few measurements and measured the quantity of ozones, and, 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 and he found that the values were disproportionate and, and daunting. He wrote to NASA, and he uh, asked NASA whether they came up with the same results, and, and, and NASA said no, the, uh, the, 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 there is no hole at all. Your machine does not work. Your machine is, uh, is, 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 broke, is broken. Now, four years later, he went back to the pole. He took a few measurements, and he, again, he identified a hole. He wrote back to NASA and said, I have the same measurements. They're even worse than four years ago. And he asked NASA to, to, to check. NASA said there was no hole at all. And the NASA researchers said, well, let's have a look at the uh, noise cancellation uh, software. So they had a look at the noise cancellation software. They uh, corrected a few uh, algorithm. But actually, the uh, algorithm had hidden the hole. And the and NASA made the right corrections and understood that uh, the hole had been there for many years, but that there was an error in the algorithm. So what we need to correct are processes in uh, the software. Now, science sometimes is ignorant because it does not identify any hole at a certain point in time and then makes the uh, correction because it has, in the meantime, identified a hole. So I think that uh, we should make the same corrections in various disciplines and in various countries as well. Thank you very much. It is also a matter of mindset. Sharing data as a researcher means uh, sharing your uh, treasure. Now, how are universities going to make sure that uh, researchers adopt the right mindsets, researchers, but also students, because this learning needs to start uh, very early. Now, let me start with students. And um, again, the three dimensions are uh, research, innovation, and education. Open science is something which is being developed in, 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 uh, through uh, trainings for PhD students. I think that uh, PhD students' training is, um, is key. And, and this is where we envisage research. This is where we envisage data handling, this is where we envisage uh, information dissemination. We start at the master's degree, but for uh, PhD students, mastering data, mastering publication is key from the beginning. And when working with PhD students, we work with the thesis professors, we work with the labs, and through our young students, uh, we, we also manage to exchange. Now, let me come to uh, support and recognition, acknowledgement. Of course, research is time consuming. Learning is time consuming. Publishing as well. I remember that in, in physics, in, in, in math and uh, IT, we publish on platforms. 
now. But at the beginning, in the past, publishing was quite difficult. And according to the various disciplines, I think that we need to make the life of researchers easier. They spend a lot of time in red tape and bureaucracy. So I think that we have to make a, a publication easier. And I think that library staff also play a key role. They have given support to open science. Uh, trades, uh, professions are changing in, in the way they uh, support uh, research. And since we ask more from researchers, our institutions need uh, to uh, support them. And when it comes to open science for uh, libraries, well, this is a key topic. If we want to uh, support our researchers in understanding open science, and we have perhaps to give a major support to, to doctors or to scientific uh, disciplines. And then data. Now, here again, there is some kind of support. But as Marin said, we need to make sure that data is accessible. I'm not saying we need to uh, clean them, but we have to make them accessible. We have to make sure that uh, publications can be understood. We need to give access to reports productability, we need to give uh, society access to science. This is what we could call participatory science. And this is, I would say, a, a virtuous circle, uh, making data accessible, making sure that data can be understood and can be reproduced, having robust uh, storage data, having uh, people who uh, help in labs, who uh, contribute to the storage of data is uh, uh, key. I, I think that uh, institutions need uh, to uh, support uh, researchers in giving and guaranteeing this access to data. So the researcher is at the core of the publication of the data. However, we also need uh, these uh, uh, support functions that would make sure that research will evolve. And then we need the PhD students. We need to promote a scientific integrity. We need to promote the proper use of science. And again, coming back to uh, open science at uh, university, I, I think that uh, in France, we are uh, very proactive in developing open science, but we need to ensure the right level of support. We need to make sure that uh, the, the shift is not too abrupt. We need to think through uh, the way we are going to uh, support this access to uh, uh, a whole range of uh, publications. So I think that uh, uh, the whole chain has a key role to play. Thank you very much. What about uh, funding agencies, uh, Veronique? Uh, these uh, funding agencies uh, fund research, but I'm sure they also have, uh, they should perhaps act as a role model in uh, the the way they guide uh, researchers uh, on the way to more open science. In the past, data production was not uh, enhanced, was not funded by the uh, National uh, Research Fund, and data production was, was, was not uh, enhanced, was not promoted. Now, uh, how are research institutes uh, uh, evolving, uh, and, and, and how, how can we make sure that uh, things evolve in the right direction? Yes. Well, on the one hand, we need to raise the awareness of researchers about the importance to be involved in uh, open science, for example, in FNRS, when researchers uh, introduce uh, research, they need to introduce a data management plan. 
which means that they already have to think about the data they will produce during their work. And they need to think about the purpose of that data and the use of that data. It's not an assessment criterion, but uh, we are encouraging researchers to look into this question. That's really the purpose of the process. Then we can also uh, say that they should take into account open science in the evaluation, but we'll come back to that later. But I agree uh, with others. I believe this is very heavy in terms of uh, funding. And for the moment, we do not have any budget lines to fund uh, <clears throat> specialists in logistics, in research logistics, and this is something we have to think about. And for the moment, we're waiting to see what are the infrastructures that will be set in place in universities, because this is where things will happen. And once we have a clarified and precise plan, we can start working within FNRS to determine what we can do. Because we are not like the S uh, CNRS, uh, we do not have our own research infrastructure. And I believe that's at the level of the uh, research infrastructure that we have to think about this topic. Yes, and this is related to research based on public fund. But of course, open science should also be interesting for the private sector. And if I understood correctly what Nicolas Cudremont said at the beginning, this should also concern the private sphere and companies and I believe that at that level, the problem is even more significant. It's not only about culture, it's also about the economic model. So how can we strike a balance between the need to be open and to make sure that this benefits to as many people as possible and the need for the company to survive from an economic point of view? Well, I would say that we have an advantage because we have the notion of value creation. Our business is research and we want to create value through uh, the solutions and uh, problem resolutions. And we can then talk about return on investment because data enables us to lead to investments. This is a potential value for us. So the costs we mentioned before can be quite limited compared to the return on investment and compared to the return that we can get from sharing data. And I'd like to come back to what Mrs. Retailleau said about training. It's not a problem for me to find researchers. I can find chemists, physicists, um, physicists or a specialist in engineering and uh, material. It's a bit more difficult for data experts. Sometimes we have to go through consultants, but the people that are difficult to find are um, people who are researchers and who also have that skill related to data, because those people are then able to process data to make sure that data can be structured, exchanged, and understood. And they really need to be aware of the value that can be extracted from data. And this enables us to use a new language with industrial partners, because sometimes in our cooperation framework, we talk about data exchange and we design win-win solutions for all partners based on data exchange, based on the structure of data in order to promote this cooperation that goes beyond a simple exchange. So this value creation is a pulling force, is a driving force in that direction. Then there is another comment I would like to make, and I believe that this is a very important point. We talked about pooling resources and data, but we did not really talk about the pace and the speed. When we talk about Europe and common project, we also talk about competitiveness. And if we mention competitiveness, we mean that we need to win or we should not be at a disadvantage compared to others such as the United States and China, for example. So uh, working together on data, knowledge, and information 
enables us to achieve the objectives that would be impossible to reach without cooperation, and we can do that faster compared to a model where we wouldn't have that cooperation. And that's very important because we are in a race, and researchers do not like that type of environment. They like to be in a quiet environment. They like to focus on research and the perfect objectives of research, but we are taking part in a race because if you achieve results one year later or too late, it's useless. And so this notion of speed and pace is very important when we talk about data exchange. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, talked earlier on about this um, appeal from Paris, this appeal for a new form or Evalu of evaluation, a new type of assessment. And quite naturally, we have moved away from open science to the way we can assess excellence and competence. Now, of course, here we're not going to ask you whether you are uh, in favor or against this evaluation, because we do evaluate and everyone is submitted to this assessment. But why do we need evaluation and what are the objectives? And I would like to turn to Marin Dacos. How can we coordinate a policy based on data sharing and a policy of evaluation? We've already mentioned that, but in the appeal of uh, Paris, what are the uh, concrete elements that should be implemented and that could be useful to us in Belgium? Because uh, we haven't had a, uh, an appeal uh, from Brussels for the moment. What we see is the opportunity of the French presidency of the Council of the European Union to organize a conference about open science. And we had 2,200 people who uh, enrolled. Now, we had to organize it online. And that was something positive, because we were able to welcome 2,200 participants. And I would like to say that we see that there is a high interest, collective interest at European level. I took part to other conferences where we had only 80 participants in the room. Um, so the EU is on the same wavelength. And the glass ceiling of open science was just the historic rules of the games. If you say, well, it's good to share your data, to share your software, make sure it can be understood by other people. And then at the end of the day, we measure your success looking at the weight you have and the publications you have. And that's a problem. And that's a real problem because it's related to cognitive uh, dissonance, you know. Um, and then you need to uh, start smoking something because it means that I will only focus on my publications. And under the iceberg, you will see very dirty things. It's very clean on the top. But under that, it will be quite dark because there is no interest to have something that is clean. So the evaluation process and system is not adapted to our modern times because it should look at all the elements and not only about the publications, so the visible part of the um, iceberg. So I believe it is important to recognize that open science is a positive principle. And I would like to say uh, that uh, France uh, voted posi positively on the decision of the EU um, to um, move from one family of criteria to a different family of criteria in Horizon Europe. Uh, you have criteria related to um, excellence, impact, and implementation. Open science was limited to impact, so it was considered as being the last element of the process, so the bonus that makes things look good. But now we have decided that this is a criterion for excellence, because this is the best way of doing research at the beginning and not only at the end of the process, when you only have a few seconds left. And this is something that was changed at European level. And we have to translate that change everywhere. So communication is not only about the alpha and the omega, it is a major 
results and publications are to be considered as important, but then you have other first-class research objects, because some people worked throughout their life to build a software that is used by researchers. Uh, some people spend years in their life to achieve results that are not publications, and they are as important as publications. And then we need to promote diversity, to have enough room for all talents. And so it would be abnormal and uh, to, to, to promote only one criterion, because we have uh, researchers, uh, res researchers, who are specialists in data, and it is really important to give more colors to evaluation so that we can consider evaluation in the plural form. Thank you. In the academy, we have a classroom for sciences in the uh, plural form. And uh, Véronique Alouin attends all the scientific committee meetings of the FNRS. And can you see major differences in terms of evaluation between the different disciplines? And what are these differences? And do you believe that some disciplines are uh, more sensitive to uh, the criteria defined in the uh, appeal from Paris? Yes, absolutely. There are uh, differences, and uh, beyond open science and evaluation, we complained uh, for uh, many years saying that there, are, there were too many metrics and indexes, but we made significant progress by signing the DORA agreement. It was signed by about 60 institutions in France, and so there was a strong development uh, with the uh, researchers who were members of these panels, and they're really focusing now on the quality of the results, and they are not simply looking at the number of publications. So I believe that this is a trend, and it is going in the right direction. Now, to come back to what you said about open science, the EU just created a consortium in order to review the evaluation methods, saying that the methods are too narrow and that they are not appropriate. Now, I wouldn't say that they are inappropriate and narrow, but they are so if you want to promote open science. So if you want to promote open science, you have to, you have to invite researchers to be involved in the process, and it should be reflected in the evaluation criteria. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to select best researchers and best projects in the short term, but if we really want to promote quality and the efficiency of research, then we can value um, the um, new evaluation procedure for open science. And so in the long run, we should be able to improve quality, even if this is something that still needs to be proven. And it's true that uh, in medicine, in medical fields, uh, we're looking at the number of publications. And I believe that the change will be slower if we really want to invite them into open science. But for human sciences, social sciences, they're more sensitive because they started open science in uh, Cairn in, um, um, in the 50s. And so I believe that this is a an evolution and a development that we can expect. Yes, um, talking about evaluation, we can also move to ranking. And so I would like to turn to the president of the university, a university um, that is in a very good position in the ranking. And this is the example that we give in France when we want to refer to a university that suddenly appeared in the uh, first positions in that ranking, but um, I would say that the method used in that ranking will have an impact on the evaluation method applied to the members of universities. So what is the solution? Yes, I believe it is important to be inside the system to be able to criticize it. it, it you can be more credible if you are inside the system. Now, 
now. I'm not going to say that this is why we are inside that circle. We're very proud of being there, but we are well aware of that impact. So for us, the uh, ranking started following a very long history. It uh, was the result of uh, very long cooperations, and it's a perfect illustration of what researchers do with other institutions compared to what we had about five years ago, because we would do the same, but we had a very segmented approach because of the French model. And I believe that this is a real potential, and that potential, we can develop it and tap into it when we have a global strategy. And that's why we're, we are hoping to have this value added, and we hope we can really combine that with a global strategy for research and innovation. Now, I would also like to say that we are moving forward thanks to these principles. And I believe that the scientific community is really uh, interested in open science. We have a, a, a faculty for medicine, science. We can see that change. But um, when you want to apply that, you know, we, we signed the DORA agreement. But how can it be implemented? You know, it's more difficult to put it into practice than to sign the agreement. So we have tried to think about the way we could implement the DORA agreement uh, in practical terms. Um, when you are researchers, you also need to think about the recognition of the training program. So before talking about the evaluation of research, we need to evaluate the uh, position of researchers, teachers who teach. So we really need to think about how they disseminate their work, their research. And then on the side of research, you know, when uh, I um, um, worked on my PhD, we had uh, um, publications, and you could be considered as something that was quite positive. But today, for our PhD students, there is competition. And if they want to be hired, because there are not many positions in the private sphere, uh, they need to have a robust uh, file. Uh, and uh, there is high competition for our students. So it's not only about the evaluation of our researchers, we also have to think about involving our PhD students in the academic world and in the private world. And there are many challenges. And um, we need to think about this different evaluation. If you do not look at the number of publications, you need to define the impact. For example, you can tell a researcher, choose five articles and tell us what is the impact. Tell us what was your contribution to this article, because there are five signatories, for example, or 10 people who worked on it. Uh, you can have a personal evaluation and then an evaluation of a team, of a laboratory. But if you want to go um, for uh, quality uh, evaluation, it requires efforts from the team, from the researchers, from the lab manager, and then you have to think about the evaluators who will have to read the whole file. Now, I'm not going to say that we do not read all the pages, but it's easier to count the number of publications than to read a file. So, of course, it's going to take more time for the researcher and for the evaluator. And we can see that we really have to think about the time that is dedicated to this evaluation, because these are colleagues, researchers, we have peer review, and that's very important. But this is a system we have to revise. How can a file be drafted? What are the concrete elements that should be highlighted? Um, maybe we could also highlight a, a wrong result or an action that was negative and that did not lead to a result. Um, if you did not achieve the positive result, it can be interesting because you can also make progress with negative results. And so I believe it is important to recognize the value of the process, the methodology, the thinking process, because this is also a source of progress for science. And once we do that, uh, we can have the 
the right evaluation file, but then we need time to understand it, to read it, and we know that the level of expertise is quite different uh, for a peer review compared to the individual assessment, the lab evaluation, and the uh, evaluation at the level of the institution. And we're really working on that for the moment. Fifty <laughs> percent of clinical trials in Europe do not lead to any publication. This means that 50 percent of clinical trials whereby we have uh, used the body of a patient either give given them placebo or other pills, and 50% of these clinical trials did not lead to any uh, publications. This is the European average, but uh, the, the figures are quite the same in France. Now, there is uh, a trend to only publish positive uh, outcomes. Now, what on what are medical and political decisions based on meta-analysis that are synthesis of similar studies made over the past 20, uh, 10 or 15 years? Now, if uh, these trials show that in uh, uh, many cases the, 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 the medication did not work, well, there will potentially be no publication. So there is a, some kind, uh, somehow a bias. So open science is not only about publication, it is about uh, making the right medical and political decisions, making informed political and medical decisions, which is not the case today, because what we are eager to publish are uh, exclusively the positive outcomes. Now, what, when we discover something, we're always happy. When we do not discover anything, we're unhappy. However, not discovering anything is, 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 is also quite uh, positive. And finding out that one medication does not work is a positive because it uh, demonstrates that this pill should not be used and that further research is necessary. So there is some kind of bias. Now, let me come back to what has just been said. We have a, a, medical, um, a, me a medical school with um, a very uh, uh, successful labs. When we talk about science, we also talk about uh, mixing cultures and uh, uh, cross-disciplinarity. But even in the medical field, now uh, oncology and and public medicine work quite differently. And in the past, these disciplines worked uh, in uh, silos, uh, individually in their own field of expertise. Labs would work together, uh, but uh, without uh, cooperating with the hospitals. Now, today, there is m more cooperation, and, 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 and we a tend to use uh, more cohorts and to publish results in a more standardized way. In medicine, you have statisticians, biostatisticians, you have experts of various disciplines that publish and understand results in their own way. So uh, having um, oncologists working with uh, public medicine experts that are used to uh, using uh, huge uh, cohorts, uh, working with biostatisticians, uh, give way to uh, excellent outcomes. As a physician, a physicist, I do note that uh, there is positive change in the way we use data, in the way we understand, and um, in interpret data. Now, the asset of working together is about uh, building bridges between disciplines, between uh, back, uh, 
backgrounds and uh, competencies, and this will certainly disrupt the way we work in open science. 21st century medicine works a lot with physics, engineering, AI, but the opposite is also true. So we better understand each other's concerns and acting as a role model as we are doing will, I think, uh, contribute to changing things. I think you have a very good point here. Now, it all comes down to transparency. And when we talk about transparency, we talk about giving visibility to failure and, and, and understanding that failing is part of research. I'm not talking about basic research, but about uh, applied research. There is no research without failures. Now, of course, these failures can be quite uh, visible when you invest in your field of activity. There's no way you can ignore failures. But this transparency would lead to a better acceptance of failure by the academic field. And I think that in the end, the academic and the academics and the industry players will certainly speak the same language. Now, I'd rather talk about uh, uh, risk-taking than talk about failure. And today, much more than it used to be the case in the past, we need uh, to understand that uh, risk-taking is crucial and funding risk is crucial. Uh, risk is about uh, basic research. And if universities do not take risk, the R&D sector will not do it because they have their own uh, profitability concerns. We need to fund risk taking much more than we do today. Now, let's not forget about uh, all the, um, the impact of uh, basic research. Now, Risk taking uh, and, and, and failure leads me to uh, speak about an Israel fund that uh, finance uh, risk taking research. And even if there is no um, tangible outcome, researchers do not need to uh, uh, repay the money that they have received, but those who make money money, thanks to their transfer of knowledge, will have, in a way, to pay back the fund because uh, through risk taking, they have been able to, uh, to generate outcome. And because of that, they will need uh, to uh, pay back the fund. And the fund will continue to uh, finance uh, research and to finance uh, innovation and profitability. So I think that we must be able to reflect upon this type of model. Let's not forget about the need to invest in the short and long term. Today, basic research is about uh, uh, the long term above all, but it is also about uh, the uh, short term. I work on nanotechnologies. In the past, well, we had a theory on paper, and we would try to uh, well, transpose this uh, theory into practice. Today, we build the technology before we understand uh, the uh, the theory of uh, this uh, technology. So there's no way we can uh, separate the two. Basic research can be fast, but it can also be slow and only lead uh, to long-term results. So risk-taking must be uh, compatible with the time. We also need to have our students understand that uh, failing is a part of life, that this, this fear of failing should not uh, prevent them from uh, trying. I think that we have lost this uh, risk-taking culture. We have lost the uh, side of it. We only talk about success. However, we also learn a lot when we fail. Now, in the uh, 
Anglo-Saxon world, it is quite different, and 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 and, and funding risk taking is part of the uh, FR FNRS action plan. Yes, we have uh, six uh, priorities in our plan, and one of the three priorities are quite relevant: cross-cutting, cross-disciplinary research. That is very difficult to appraise to assess, you have to have your projects assessed by a commission, then we also fund uh, uh, risky projects. Uh, we talk about high risk, high gain uh, projects, and the uh, OECD has uh, created uh, a benchmark uh, for risk taking projects. And the only way to proceed is to have a budget line, a specific financial instrument. Now, if you have a very risky project next to other projects that are less risky but still. Uh, but are still uh, highly qualitative, well, experts will be quite reluctant in uh, investing um, 500,000 uh, euros in uh, in a risky project. And then the third priority, now we are a strategic research fund. We operate in life science. We have the, the equivalent in the Flanders region. And researchers are funded on excellent basic research projects, but they have to show a specific interest in um, giving value to uh, their uh, project, to their uh, findings, and patents have been filed. So some projects were very successful. Others are less successful. However, they were funded. Uh, uh, they were given three, uh, granted uh, 350,000 euros uh, per year. However, we do see the fallout of some of these projects. However, the fallout do not always um, succeed in, in funding many other projects, or at least not in the short term. Now, in this Europe of knowledge, there is also the uh, concept of mobility and of uh, um, a free movement. Now, what can we say about uh, European universities? We talked about Harry Saclay and Commu that uh, cooperate together, but um, do these uh, uh, major consortia of seven or eight uh, universities, uh, do they face uh, uh, serious challenges, uh, serious uh, hurdles. I think that uh, one of our speakers is quite familiar with these uh, uh, hurdles. Now, uh, yesterday night, we uh, started the second stage of uh, this um, a cooperation. During the first stage, we focused on cooperation. Now, during the first stage, uh, the, um, the, 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 the consortium and Paris Saclay works on, uh, on, on, on healthcare mainly. And we have expanded the uh, consortium. And we are now nine universities. We wanted to include uh, uh, other European countries in in the alliance so as to foster good practices exchange, so as to get to know each other. Of course, a European university does not uh, uh, determine uh, the way European politics handle uh, politics towards uh, universities. We have started working on students' mobility, on researchers' mobility, and on university staff. Uh, mobility. I think that if we want our students and staff to uh, benefit uh, from what
what other universities are doing. They also need uh, to, uh, well, to travel. Now, of course, uh, academic staff and students do it, but uh, university staff do it less. And uh, mobility rate is not as high as we would uh, tend to think. So we foster mobility, physical mobility, but also virtual mobility. Now, virtual mobility could never replace um, uh, physical mobility, but uh, with the pandemic, we had no choice. Some students, for financial reasons, for health reasons, do not have the opportunity to travel abroad. With the virtual mobility program, they can exchange and uh, they can also benefit from classes given by other European universities. And this, of course, contribute to a major openness. We have also developed uh, good practices on, on research. We've started to uh, exchange with uh, industrial players on uh, intellectual property, on the definition of a, an ecosystem in Hungary, in uh, Portugal, etc. We've uh, started working on researchers' mobility, the whys and the hows, and we've learned a lot through these uh, exchanges within the alliance. I think that uh, we also have to uh, uh, build the uh, and, and to strengthen the uh, identity of European students. And working with other universities is, is very enriching. It makes uh, culture, knowledge more accessible. And again, mobility has to serve everyone within the uh, academic world. Now, I'd like to come to the last two topics. When we talk about Europe of knowledge, we talk about uh, basic but also applied research. We shouldn't oppose one to the other. But I'd like you to say a few words about uh, the type of links, the type of structure that uh, we would need to develop so as to avoid opposing basic and applied research and uh, I think that uh, very often uh, basic research is the poor relation. So how can we better, uh, how can we uh, build more links, more bridges between basic and applied research without, of course, getting rid of any disciplines that at first sight would uh, look uh, unprofitable. Now, perhaps some economic models would uh, tend to favor only some disciplines and would leave aside other less profitable disciplines. Nicholas, since uh, this is one of uh, the priorities uh, you work on beyond these agreements that uh, they are uh, between universities. How can we uh, stress uh, the bridges uh, between the two types of research? There is public and private mobility. When I arrived at Solvay, I was talked about the mixed mobility of the CNRS, and I thought that this sounded very common complex, but on the contrary, it is great. It's a, a mixed unit is a research center uh, owned by Solvay, within which uh, both Solvay and uh, F, uh, CNRS researchers work together. Now, of course, we do not want uh, uh, them to start working on applied research. They work on, on basic research in line with uh, the topic of the um, research center. We do our utmost to protect privacy. And the outcomes are great. This interface is truly successful. And I think that we should avoid separating um, basic and applied research. They 
go hand in hand. And having people who've worked in both fields uh, and have gone back and forth from one field to the other are the uh, the pioneers of great innovation through uh, skills, uh, fields, uh, combinations. These people act as integrators. So mobility among universities, among companies, between the public and the private sector is key. We traveled with the um, the board of Solvay to um, uh, California. We uh, interviewed a, a few people and, and we tried to uh, uh, understand the specificities of the uh, Silicon Valley. And a, a Berkeley professor uh, summed it up. He talked about uh, the quality of university, he talked about the climate, but he enhanced the use and the need for mobility. The uh, successful startups in uh, the digital sector or in uh, hard sciences are people who've uh, traveled uh, uh, worldwide and this mobility helps uh, building connections that uh, allow for the uh, innovation to um, to happen so though i am a um, i'm a representative of the uh, of, of the industry uh, i don't think that uh, we should um, we should avoid uh, funding uh, basic uh, research and and there is one item i'd like to highlight so basic research is it's not about expenditure, it is about uh, investing. And then as far as risk-taking is uh, concerned, speaking about a risk-taking is something that we should avoid. I have projects where the uh, success probability is less than 10%, and my CFO is going to say, no, 10% uh, of likelihood for success. No, we're wasting the money of our company. But we do not have a project with this 10% probability. We have 20 projects with that kind of probability. And out of all 20 projects, some of them will succeed, and that's important. So we should stop talking about projects. We should start talking about portfolios. And I believe that fundamental research should improve its marketing. And I know it's obscene to talk about marketing to people who are dedicated to fundamental research, but we should sell that product to uh, uh, the taxpayers to the public. Why do we have fundamental research? We cannot have applied research without fundamental research. Well, you can have that during a couple of years, but not during decades. And I believe it is important to explain that to the population, to sell that idea to uh, the public, even if we do not like that term. Yes, I believe that this is something that is quite relevant and maybe be interesting for FNRS, yes, selling fundamental research and focusing on marketing. Well, when we worked on the framework agreement Horizon Europe, uh, the EU and research really mobilized and made efforts to sell the concrete results of uh, projects funded by the European Council to the public. And you are perfectly right, and this is something that is taking place more and more, in my view. However, why, what do we mean by articulating or coordinating fundamental research? Because it's all well and good to have people to talk to one another. But if you have a funding mechanism covering both, that's not that positive because the evaluation criteria are too different. And so in some countries, you can see that people are not investing anymore in fundamental research in order to promote uh, research into societal uh, challenges, talking about aging, climate change. And so if you want to assess projects before they can be funded, we will look at this impact criterion. And of course, uh, we are following the time of policies and politics, and this is a short-term period. And so, of course, we will focus on impact. And I do not think that this will be positive from a governance point of view, and 
this will not lead to more money. For the moment, 25% uh, is dedicated to fundamental research, and the rest of the funding is dedicated to strategic research. And I agree with you, Mr. Permanent Secretary. Uh, we have room for each type of research, and they all have their values, but we need to strike a balance in the way we fund those different fields. And I do not totally agree uh, with you when you talk about this continuity, the, the continuum of uh, research, because this is related to a linear model for innovation, where we start with fundamental research, then the prototype, the development, and the marketing process. An innovation process can be much more complex, and sometimes uh, you can have a return coming from an application, from fundamental research, from feedback loops. So there are many different innovation models. And sometimes one researcher will focus on fundamental research and then be involved in another form of research. And I believe that we have enough room to have quite diverse models. Yes, just to clarify, for me, the real uh, fundamental research is moved and triggered by human curiosity. And that's it. So we can forget about this linear approach. It's more like a, 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 a cloud creating the uh, con conditions and the connections that we need with a breeding ground. Yes, but it's difficult to measure the impact of fundamental research. There are impact assessments and there are impacts, but in the short term, in the midterm, in the long term. And uh, you also have to look at the impact of training of people who have a, an efficient brain for a Europe of knowledge, and there we would like to achieve but I would like to um, turn to you once again for a last round table, and I would like to ask you what would be, in your view, the measure that would be necessary and efficient to uh, develop and promote this Europe of knowledge at European level. So what should we do at European level? Maybe not at the level of member states, but of course, those measures will be translated at national level. But in your view, what are the measures, the initiatives that will be required at European level? Because we now have the uh, French presidency of the Council of the European Union. So now is the time to come up with proposals and suggestions to close this part of the debate before we open up to the audience. And I will start with uh, Nicolas. Well, once again, if I come back to the principle of Europe and the purpose of Europe, what I would like uh, is to play in order to win and not to play in order not to lose. What I would like to see is visions, initiatives that are European visions that can only be achieved through cooperation. So objectives that cannot be reached by independent member states. But here again, uh, we would like to win that race for sustainable development. It could be in the field of green mobility. We talked about uh, batteries, and that's another example, but that was a responsive or reactive approach. Out of the 10 best suppliers, seven come from China, then you have two from Korea and one from Japan. So there is no balance. And so we created the airbus of battery in order to catch up on that delay. But I believe it is important to make a decision now to determine the position that we will achieve before the others. And I'm very sorry. I know that people don't like that, but we are in a race. And from a geopolitical uh, point of view, we really need to adopt our position and take our place on that international scene. So I think, yes, and I hear something ringing. I think it's time for us to stop. So I would like to see um, a visionary projects that will really pull Europe towards innovation, applied research, fundamental research. And this would be really a, a, an enthusiastic movement that could be sold to the population, because we should not be members of an elite 
working on research and just saying thank you when we receive millions of euros in subsidies, I believe it's really important to work on the buy-in of the population. Yes, I fully agree with that. And I would say that we already have many tools at our disposal. So for the European uh, Commission and looking at the last framework agreement with the Horizon Europe, and if I take off the, the example of those two to tools, we talked about European universities. And if you look at the funding and the objectives and the ambitions of these European tools, we are not up to the expectations. We are not at the right level. So we have to go all the way through the process. So I think it is important for the investments to be sufficient. So the EU and the member states should make efforts. And I believe that this is a very ambitious uh, tool, but we do not have the right investments. So we need to fund the investments sufficiently so that they can be a success. Then there is a second example about a fundamental research. And if I take examples such as uh, Marie Curie, if you look at the envelope of Horizon Europe, it has decreased. It's 25% for uh, fundamental research. We used to have 33% in Horizon 2020. So funding has decreased for fundamental research. But I fully agree with you. If you have, um, uh, you need to make a difference between those different forms. But in the boards of uh, EIC, CRC, you have this uh, cooperation, and that's very good. They're not working in opposition, and that's all well and good. But we need to pay attention because we have moved away from 33% to 25%, and this is a very bad signal. So we need to make sure that the investments are at the level of our ambitions in Europe. And I fully agree with you. If we want to have um, funding for research in Europe, we need to make sure that the public opinion understands the challenges of research. And we need to know how to communicate about the consequences and the work we do, because in that case, then the investment will be made to have the right impact. So we need to invest sufficiently. And for the moment, funding is declining in research. Maranda Kos, yes, I would say that um, medicine uh, doctors publish in English, then you have uh, um, others publishing in uh, French uh, when they work in France, and this uh, is not facilitating communication. And I believe it is important to uh, invest in translation, automatic translation and not automatic translation. I believe it would be important to publish in different, uh, maybe not publish in different languages, but there is um, um, Finnish a review that uh, um, analyzed the readers and they realized that language was an issue. And if we say that open science is a tool that is not only limited to peers and researchers, uh, if we want it to be open, then we need to be able to publish in local languages. Now, of course, I'm not going to say that we need to publish our articles in Finnish and Polish when working in medicine, but we need to make sure that citizens can have access to these publications, because up to 25% of users of platforms are not academics. And they will only read the publications if you can go beyond this language barrier. So I believe it would be important to invest in translation in order to disseminate that information because people need to have access to science. And sometimes they cannot have access to those publications because of the language barrier. Thank you very much. Veronique. Well, I would like to react along the same lines as uh, um, Sylvie Rotaillot. I believe it is important to work on the investments and the envelopes, and we agree on the figures. This is exactly what we need to, to do. Now, of course, the European program has only started, so we need to give it a chance, but we need to invest more. That's 
that's clear because uh, there are many complex challenges. They require competences, excellence. We need to push back the borders of knowledge. And we were talking about others and this competition. We need to set clear objectives. But Mariana Buzzutato, for example, who designed the new European program, uh, wrote in a book about the entrepreneur state that an iPhone is massively funded by uh, public funds, by CERN, for example, and Apple used that process to make it a commercial success. But of course, you need to be smart, intelligent uh, to uh, promote this uh, research process. And that process was funded by public funds. So I think it's very important to make significant public investment in fundamental research and not only in strategic research. A decision-making process based on emotions. It is uh, 8 o'clock sharp. At this point, I'd like to thank all all our uh, speakers, and I also would like to thank uh, the audience and the uh, participants for uh, having an active uh, participation in this debate. I think that the reflection will go on because beyond science, beyond Europe of knowledge, there are many challenges that relate to uh, living together uh, and, and scientific culture is about questioning. It is also about managing doubt. And, and this is something that uh, we very much lack at uh, this point in time. Thank you very much for your attendance.